once a man who was in the military. And I can relate to the story a lot because I'm in the military. There was once a man who was in the military. and He was a devout Christian. And one day this man is sitting with his, with his platoon. And they're all picking on him because he's such a, such a devout Christian. And he doesn't curse. And he doesn't joke around the same way everybody else curses. And, and whoever has been in the military here, they know that that's like a second language in the military. They already know. So, so, so this Christian is different. I mean, I'm telling you right now, over there, my, I have my, I'm ranked PFC Perez. But for some of them, I am Pastor Perez. Brother Minister Perez, Bishop Reverend, they got all sorts of names for me. I don't even know which one to take. Because for them, it's unusual to see somebody who is in the military, but is also like how oh, I am. And, and this man was like this. This man was a devout Christian. And one day, they're all sitting, they're all sitting in a parking lot. And they all have this, they have a whole bunch of Humvees lined up. And this man has, not, has no license. He has no license to drive the Humvees. In the military, you need a license to drive Humvees. But they're making fun of him because he was saying that God can do all things to them that believe. He was talking to them about that. If I believe, God can do all things for me. So then his platoon sergeant was like, if that's so, get in that Humvee right there. I want you to drive it. And he knows that he can't drive it. He said, God's going God's to teach you. He'll teach you. So they all started laughing. The man got real nervous. The Christian man got real nervous. But you know what he did? He got in that Humvee. He got on that Humvee. He was ready to roll. He got on the Humvee. He was like, God, I don't know how to drive this, but you're going to teach me. So he turned on the Humvee. And when he turned it on, he took it for a lap and he parked it and everything. When he got off from the Humvee, everybody in his platoon, they were all crying, scared. His platoon sergeant came to him. What? He's like, what's going on? All I did was just give it a lap. He's like, you don't understand. This Humvee does not have a motor. Let me tell you something, church. The God I know will put a motor in your Humvee. The God I know will put a motor in your car. He will make the enemy less you look like a fool. He will, he will look, look, look. Let me tell you something. That's, that's why I, look, if I, if I was that Christian, perhaps, perhaps you would be the Christian will start trying to create excuses and saying, you know, God, I, I can't drive this. I need some, I need some years of lessons. I need to figure out how I'm going to do this. But God's telling you the entire time, I got this. I will take care of this. You need to follow my lead. You need to turn on the Humvee. Don't worry about what's inside. I will take care of that. Yeah. Hallelujah. And it brings me to the story that I want to talk to you guys about. Hallelujah. Let's open the Bibles in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's a powerful book once you get past the, 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 the begotten, the begotten, the begotten, the begotten. <laughs> That's a lot of powerful. Powerful. 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. And then we're going to jump to verse 12. But let's start here first. Amen? And the Bible says, some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Adam and from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already Hazam Tamar, that is in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Now look at verse 12. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. There came a time during the kingdom of Jehoshaphat where he was completely cornered by three different kingdoms. Completely cornered. And as the king of Israel, he knew, as the king at the time, he knew that his army, there was no way on earth that they could deal with three kingdoms coming against them. Even though he had warning. He knew of the warning. He was ready because he knew, but mathematically and numerically, there was no way he could fight this war. It was a big issue. And the first thing that says about Jehoshaphat, it says, alarmed. Look, let me ask you, what would you do if you're in this position? Alarmed. Jehoshaphat just turned. He resolved to inquire to God. That's the first thing we do when something bad happens. Right, church? Every time something bad happens, we always go to the, why me? 
Holy God, I, I mean, why would you? And you're alarmed. I don't understand. You need to tell me what's going on. I need vision. And you need to know everything. You need to figure out what's going on. Look at what happens. In verse 13, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, and the son of Benaniah, and the son of Jael, and the son of Mataniah, a Levite, and the son of Asaph, and he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. I say again, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance of the Lord, and he will give you Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Church, let me tell you something. There is a lot of fight and a lot of battles that you are preparing to fight all on your own. A lot of things are knocking on your door, and the first thing you do is become alarmed. The first thing you do is turn to inquiring God, what are you going to do about it? The first thing that you do is go crazy, and you start calling all your friends, and you call pastor, I need prayer, I need anointing, something needs to happen, all these bills are piling up, all the, my husband is going crazy, my kids are going crazy, my car don't work, I have no gas for my tank, I don't know what to do, I am alarmed. And you're preparing yourself to fight this fight all on your own. You are telling yourself, I have to come up with a way to fix this problem. I have to fix this on my own. Let me ask God what advice he has for me to do this all on my own. But let me tell you something. God has a different plan. See, because while God is looking at you going all crazy and running around like a headless chicken, he already has the problem solved. The problem you have is that you find yourself telling God how big your problem is when you should be telling your problem how big your God is. Because that's the problem. Because the situation is that we will see the issue right in front of us. And church, it's very hard. It's very hard to sometimes believe and believe and believe. Because you know what? When you tell you get out of this powerful service and then Monday morning comes around and you open your mailbox and your account is in the red. Or you got a collections card. Or you get a phone card that's calling you all the time, telling you all the money. And you have no income coming in. It's very difficult to grasp the idea that something's going to give. But I have to remind you, church, that this fight, you will not have to fight. You don't have to fight this battle. Because God already is in the plans. God is already in the works. God is gearing up. Look, the moment that you realize you have a problem, God's armor has already been up. God has already been ready to fight. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like he has an alarm system. You know, like if you have an alarm system in your house, sometimes the alarm will go off and you won't even know you're sleeping and the police will show up to your house and they'll ask you, somebody tried to break in and you didn't even know about it. But thank God for that alarm. That's the way God works. God is geared to fight for you even when you cannot fight for yourself. Let me tell you, God is going to fight for you even when you want to fight for yourself and you're telling him, I don't want you. He's going to do it anyways. Because God cannot go back on his word. The Bible says heaven and earth shall pass, but his word, his word shall not pass. That means that whatever you got to say, whatever you got to say, whatever I got to say, whatever pastor has to say, it all is going to pass. But what he said concerning your safety and concerning your resolve and concerning your miracle cannot pass. Hallelujah. And look at what happened. Look at in verse 20. Verse 20. It says, early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord. Your God and you will be established. 
Have faith in his prophets and you shall prosper. I'm going to read that again one more time. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be established. Have faith in his prophets and you shall prosper. Church, you know how many times Pastor Bo will get up here and tell you what you need to do all the time? All the time. It's very difficult to be a prophet in your own land, you understand? Because the, the church will think, well, he's saying that because he knows me. Because I just had a meeting with him yesterday, so that's why he's preaching that right now. Look, let me tell you, when you're preaching, and I'll tell you this from experience, when you're preaching, the last thing you're thinking about is the, the meeting you had an hour ago. When you're preaching, the last thing you're thinking about is well, well, what you got to do when you, when you leave the church. It's the last thing you're thinking about. You got almost 200 people staring at you for you to feed them something. The last thing the pastor is thinking is, how am I going to impress this one person that told me that one problem yesterday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Pastor is speaking by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Pastor is speaking by, by an anointing and a, and a word that you need to hear. That's why it is imperative that you believe God so that you are established. But then it says believe your prophet because your prophet has the instructions. Your pastor has the instructions. Your leaders, they have the instructions. That's why I always go on YouTube whenever I get a new toy for Liana. For my daughter, because the instructions are there. But look, let me tell you something about writing. That's not my ministry. Whenever those little layouts are there, and it says, this, is, this nail does not look like that at all. Whoever drew this needs deliverance. <laughs> and you're always, I mean, I, I need somebody to teach me. So I go on YouTube, thank God for YouTube, and somebody on YouTube went through a hard time just like me, so they're going to figure it out. And then after they got it together, they had the patience to break it back down and then teach the world how to do it. Thank you, God, for that soul. <laughs> it's important that you have somebody to teach you and to break it down for you. It's important that somebody, look, when you're sitting down and you're a young Christian and you're going through a situation that makes you feel vulnerable, it is important that you have somebody to break down the word for you, break down the bread and put it in breadcrumbs and separate it in the plate for you so that you can pick on it and you can eat and nourish yourself without choking. And that's what a pastor does. But sometimes we think that his job is to scold you. That my job as a preacher is to give you a woo sermon. It's not always the case. My job is to look. My wife knows I went to bed like at 1 o'clock in the morning last night. I had no idea. Look, every time I come up here, I would tell myself, God, you better use me. Because I will leave the microphone right here. And you're going to have to talk by yourself. <laughs> every time. Because... What's going to happen is that people will come to listen, trying to feed themselves. People, that's why we come to church. We come to church to get energized, to receive something. So what would be the point in coming to church and having a hard time believing what your pastor is telling you? So why'd you come? So become receptive to what the church has to say to you, what your pastor has to say to you. Because he went through, I work with him every day, day in, day out. That man eats Bible cornflakes. I promise you. That man is always eating the word of God day in and day out. He'll tell me, I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was like, look, I was feeding my daughter at 2 o'clock in the morning. What are you doing? He's already working on sermons for two to three months from now. He's always praying and always trying to seek new word to bring to his church. So it's imperative that you hold on to whatever he has to say. Am I, am I, am I, am I, am I reaching somebody this morning? Yeah. Believe his prophet. But look what happens. That's another sermon. It's another sermon. I'm going to need another CD for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. After consulting the people... Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out ahead of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his mercies, for his mercies endureth forever. Sometimes church, when your problem comes, you start doing the wrong thing. Sometimes prayer ain't going to do it for you. Sometimes an offering ain't going to do it for you. Sometimes just showing up to church ain't going to do it for you. Sometimes it is important for you to know you're going to face your enemy and your instinct is to worship. 
That's why, look, church, you need to come on time at 10 o'clock. Look, you need to not miss worship. It's important for you to create that atmosphere of worship. You worship God, and you worship God. You worship God. When I want, when I want to get something from my wife, and I want her to let me, you know, hey, you know, I really want to get this shirt. And I know I just got to go, hallelujah. I just got to go talk to her, and I go, I, I love your hair. I said, it's a great hair. Did you do something to it? No, I have a hat on. Oh, well, it's great. You know, when I look, when you want something, you be nice. You, you start, you start to, to sweet talk that ear. There's nothing that tickles God more from his throne. Look, that's why King David, the Bible says that King David had a heart according to God's own heart. You know why? Look, King David was crazy too. King David did a whole bunch of things that a lot of people would be ashamed of even telling. But David knew how to do one thing. David knew how to fall and get right back up with worship. David didn't even finish with an amen. Every time was, oh my God, you are so beautiful. You are so mighty. I love you. I will sing to you all day. And that's why every time David did anything, I always say that David was the one man in the Bible who found one God's weakness. The one thing that would make God, a, give God a tickle spot and say, stop. That one thing that would make God do that is literally worship. When things start getting weary in your house and you say hallelujah. When things start getting real difficult in your marriage, you say I worship you. When things start getting difficult at work, you say I worship you. When there is no money coming in and no money going out, you say I worship you. And then, and then when that happens, church, let me tell you something. The devil's throwing at you with everything he's got. He's taking off his sneakers and throwing them at you. And he doesn't know why you're still worshiping. So he throws them off. The Bible says, submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. But there is a secret. Submit. Submit yourself unto God. Look, the reason why there is a resistance is because the devil ain't giving up either. He is not going to give up either. He got plans for you too. The Bible says that he is like a lion. Roaring, seeking to see who he may devour. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. He's not getting no food from me. He's going to have to go get some coupons. He ain't getting nothing from me. He ain't getting nothing from this church. It's important that you understand the secret of worship. God's instruction was, I got this battle for you. I will fight this battle for you. I will win this battle for you. But I just need you to do one thing for me, church. And that is, I, 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 really, want, I really want to hear you worship me while I do it. That's why, that's why when you're seeing a boxing fight or you're seeing a wrestling fight, and then, and then the, the fighter that you want to win, the whole crowd starts going crazy and say, screaming his name. What do you think starts happening? That fighter starts going crazy and he starts fighting harder. Look, God likes to be cheered on. God likes to be cheered on when he does. He doesn't want us to be just standing by like it's a golf game. That's not how it works. Christians are loud. We're loud. That's why I worship and I act like this all the time. Because if not, I must have signed up for the wrong thing. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. God, God works on the worship. The Bible says that he is in the midst of worship. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, he shall be there. So there is a secret in worship, especially in the congregation of the saints. The Bible says where his brethren abide together in harmony and love, he shall stand in life and blessings forevermore, for he finds it delicious. So there is a secret in worshiping God together. There is a secret in coming together and worshiping God in the midst of situations. Because I promise if I sit with one of you individually, you all got a story to tell Brother Anthony. And Brother Anthony is going to have to pray for something. I promise you that. But the best part about it is that we all sat down in a purple and a red chair and we came to worship regardless of the problem. That, that's, that's the secret of prevailing when the devil hits you hard and you're, and, and you're just like a bobblehead, you just come right back up. It confuses the enemy. 
The Bible says that he speaks of things that are not as if what? As if they are. The Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. So whenever the enemy is hitting you hard and he thinks he hit you where you're weak at, you say, no, you must have missed because that didn't do nothing. You taunt him. Hallelujah. Let's keep reading. Verse 22. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. Look, the Bible says further up in that chapter that there was that when they walked up to the to the battleground, they were all dead. If you keep reading, the Bible says that they are, look, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that they dropped spoils. You know what spoils are? That's gold and, and silver. Look, who comes to a fight with gold and silver? Who does that? God must have made them go like, if I'm going to go fight, I need to look good. I need to have this bling on. If I'm going to die, I, I need to have this diamond. I, this, if I, I don't fight without my lucky diamond ring, I, that must be them. Who thinks like that? God, God must have said, if you're going to go fight, that's why I know that God had a plan already before, before Jehoshaphat or even prayed because they were already packing all their bling before they even showed up to the fight. And the Bible says that they picked up spoils for three whole days because they didn't have enough room to pick it up. So, so on top of God being the one who, who was the one who fought, who was the mercenary on your behalf, who went out and fought for you and got the person destroyed for you and the enemy destroyed for you, on top of that, he wasn't the one who got paid. You got paid for three whole days. Hallelujah. Could you imagine payday three days in a row? Sweet Jesus. Could you imagine that? It's Friday. You wake up. It's Friday. It's Friday. The Lord is good. <laughs> you know I get three tithes to that too. Hallelujah. Three tithes. Hallelujah. That's why, that's why, church, I want you to understand, and I want you to have joy when I tell you this, when I speak to you. I want you to laugh, and I want you to realize that there is no need to be in depression. There is no need to be in sadness. There is no need to be in darkness, because you know how they say that at the end of the tunnel, there is a light? Look, I refuse to believe I'm in a tunnel at all. There's no way I could be in a tunnel, because I already won the battle, because God told me I don't have to go through no tunnel. I will be the victor regardless. Open your Bibles to the book of Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Very popular story. But every time I, I, I read this story, I, I wish they made a movie from it. I just want to see it because it's, it's a very powerful, powerful story. Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, and then verses 15 and 16 and verse 20. Amen? Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of rams, horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing on the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up and everyone will go in straight in. Are you hearing the directions and the instructions that God gave Joshua? I want you to understand what's going on here. The army of Israel is ready to conquer Jericho, the promised land. They were ready to get what that which had been waiting for decades. They have been praying for this for decades. And finally, God told them, it's time. I have given it to you. It's time for me to give it to you. But Joshua is talking to God all by himself. So I'm pretty sure Joshua was talking to his people. Guess what, guys? Are you guys ready for this? God just told me to go talk to him because he's going to tell me what we're going to do. 
And the people are like, yeah, that's awesome. That's great. You go, Joshua. You find out what we're going to do. And he's like, right on it. And he goes around. And then God tells him, okay, so this is the plan. Joshua's all excited. This is the plan. And God tells him, hey, check it out. This is what I want you to do. I want you to walk around the city for a few times like a madman. And at the end, I want you to scream real crazy loud. And then when that happens, the walls are going to fall off. And you're not going to walk around it. You're going to walk right through it. If I would have been Joshua, I would have said, can you say that one more time? <laughs> Maybe I think, I think I probably had music in my head or something, and I could not understand. I could have sworn you said that I have to walk around and scream, and the walls are going to fall, and I'm going to go through the wall, or are we going to jump over it, or what's the plan? I have ropes. I planned it. I have an idea of what we need to do, and God said, you're not hearing me. I already told you what I need you to do. I need you to go on ahead and walk around the city. I need you to be blowing real big horns and making a lot of noise because church, that's what we do. You understand? And then, and you play, and you do all the noise that you need to do. And on the seventh day, when that happens, I will tear down that wall and you will go right through. If I would have been Joshua at that moment, I would have said, well, Roger that. I'll go talk to the people right now. And I could just imagine Joshua coming back. Oh, I got a plan. Yeah, everybody gather. Joshua has a plan. <laughs> now, how would you be, how would you act if you're Joshua and the whole people of Israel is waiting for a very serious plan on how to conquer this impenetrable city which has not been conquered and on top of that has giant walls. The Bible says that the walls were so thick that people were living on the walls. So we're not talking about no small, it was not a fence. This, the walls itself were a city all on its own. Thick walls. And they were guarded by men. So on top of that, how do you feel? How do you think Joshua got the moment he was like, oh my God, I'm going to tell these people. And the people are all excited, the puppy eyes. <laughs> hey, what's the plan? I'm ready. And Joshua's like, ready? You guys ready? You're going to do this, this, and that. You're going to walk around, and you're going to scream, and you're going to kick and at the end of that all, you're going to scream real loud, even louder than what you were screaming before. And then when that happens, the walls are going to come down. I can just imagine at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody at the end. What? <laughs> just that awkward silence. And if I, would, if I would have been one of Joshua's friends, I would have been like, he's just playing around, man. Tell him, tell him for real what we're going to be doing. <laughs> the reaction that the people of Israel would have gotten from Joshua would have been the same any of us would have given because they were people just like you and me. So if somebody would have come to me with a very serious plan like that, I would have been disturbed. I would have known what to do. And that's the situation. That's the way God sometimes tells you to do something. You told God, God, I have to pay this bill. But I don't have money. I already, I already got paid. And God tells you, I understand. This is what you're going to do. And you're, talking, you're thinking he's going to tell you, you're going to go apply here. And you're going to do that. He's going to say, okay, this is what I want you to do. Tomorrow morning, I want you to wake up real early and make it on time on church. And I want you to worship me real hard. And I got it. And you tell yourself, God, I'm going to pray again. <laughs> the devil's talking in my head. And I don't want that to block what you got to tell me. Because then you start telling yourself, that must be you talking to yourself. It's not you talking to yourself. The way God works, look, if God did it in a way that made sense, then you might as well have done it all yourself. I don't want to serve a God that I can understand. The reason why I come and I serve a God that makes no sense is because if I could understand them, that I would go to the church of, bro uh, of Brother James or the church of Brother Anthony and I would worship Anthony on Sundays because Anthony will figure it out too. But Anthony don't do the things that God does. Anthony can split the water in two. Anthony cannot bring the dead back to life. Anthony cannot heal. Anthony cannot do the things that God does. Anthony cannot walk on water. Anthony cannot make water into wine. Anthony is not the one who sits in heaven and makes the earth his footstool he is the almighty God he is the understandable God he is the God that nobody can understand he is the God that talks in parables so that you can understand he is the God that became a man so that he can speak your language so that you can understand he is the God of perfection the God of excellence so there's no way on earth church that when he tells you an instruction you're supposed to understand it you're just supposed to obey it
because God operates outside of time. Time is not out, outside of God. Time is inside of God. God created time so that you and me know when service is about to end. <laughs> That's why he made time. God does not operate on a time basis. God operates on a God basis. God, that's why when he told Abraham, hey, Abraham, I'm going to give you this descendants that you will count the stars. And you know who he swore? He said, I swore it on myself because God don't got nobody else higher than himself to swear by. So when God takes a decision, it is an executive decision. It is an ultimate decision. It is a decision that cannot be vetoed. Look, you can't take that to court. You cannot fight that. You can't get no alibi. You can't get nothing. When he says something, it is done. So when God tells you, I have a plan for you, this is what I want you to do, it's because God is telling you based on how he sees things. See, church, you see yourself on what you did yesterday and what you're doing right now. So your decision making is based on, on your experience. So you know that hot, that fire is hot because you've touched it before or because you've come near it. So therefore, you know, you don't touch fire, right? God don't operate like that. God doesn't need experience because God hasn't learned from his mistakes. Because he don't make mistakes. So when God takes a decision, he's looking at you not on past and present like you look at yourself. God looks at you in the past, the present, and the future. So God goes on ahead and tells you, well, I see where you are right now. But guess what, Brother Anthony? I also see you where you are over here. And because you're supposed to be over here, I'm going to make you do something crazy and drag you from point A to point B. And I'm going to put people in your life that are going to challenge you. And they're going to push you. And they're going to teach you. And they're going to tell you what to do, even if it is something as crazy as worshiping in the middle of the night that's the way God works that's the way God works church look what happens look at what happens let's keep reading on the seventh day in verse 15 on the seventh day they got up at daybreak early in the morning so they they all fought the battle of the blanket and they won on the seventh day they got up at daybreak and marched around the city Seven times in the same manner. Except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Verse 20 says, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the man gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. Look at your neighbor and say, look, neighbor, your wall will collapse. Look at your neighbor and say, your wall will collapse. Your wall will collapse. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. Let me tell you something, church. I don't know what wall the devil has created between you and your miracle. But today, today, that wall will collapse. Today, that wall will collapse. So if that takes for you to make a loud shout, then you make a loud shout. If that's for you to get up and jump, then you get up and jump. The whatever wall, whatever wall has to be collapsed, has to be collapsed by the reason of worship, by the reason of worship, by the reason of worship. I don't think the church is screaming loud enough. You must not want that wall to come down. You must want that wall to stay right where it's at. You must want that wall to stay right where it's at. You scream hard and you push through, you push through, you push through, you push through. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say good preaching, Brother Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. I practice. I practice. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Look at what the Bible says in Psalms 46. Look what the Bible says in Psalms 46, verse 10, 11. He says... Psalms 46, verses 10 and 11. He says, be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still. Church, you're getting a little hyper sometimes. And you get a little too... Like, what am I going to do? What's the next plan? No, be still and let the professional deal with the issue. 
look, if I, have, if I have an issue with my cable box and I call the cable TV company and the cable TV company tells me, well, I'm going to send a repairman. When that repairman comes, I'm not going to tell him, okay, come here, let me tell you what you need to do. Because if not, I wouldn't have called the repairman at all. If the repairman came, let him do what he got to do. Look, his shirt says Bright House on it, not yours. So let him do what he's got to do. He's got that really cool van with all the cables and the, and the scissors. You don't have that. You got a little, a little Chevy or a minivan like myself. I don't do cable TV. So let the repairman fix that all on his own. Amen? Amen? When God comes into your house and he knocks on your door and he says, did you call? Is there a problem in here? Let him fix it. The Bible says I knock at your door and if somebody hears me and opens the door, I will come in and I will dine with him and he will dine with me. You understand that God is a generous God. God is a gentleman. God will sit and knock on your door because you called. Because you called. Because sometimes you think you're not praying hard enough. But guess what? When you cry, it's a call. When you're sitting down thinking on your problem, it's a call. When you're pondering on how to get out, and you can't swim, it's a call. It is a call. So when you call, he will answer and knock on your door. All you need to do is let him come in so he can fix whatever issue you got, church. Hallelujah. Look what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 11. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. Another version says like a mighty giant. So my, pers my, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Church, tell your neighbor and say right now, did you know God is rolling with me? You know how when you're walking around with somebody who got a lot of power and you walk just like he, you, you want to act like him. And, you know, even though you, he, he's, got a, he's got an Armani suit and you got that Walmart suit. Hallelujah. Thank you for Walmart. And you got that outfit on and you still want to act for it. You want to act like him because you're rolling with somebody. You're rolling with somebody who got a lot of power. So you walk tall. That's the way it should be with God, church. That's why it is imperative that when you walk anywhere, you walk as if. God is right there physically, and everybody can see him walk in. The Bible says, the Bible says that in the presence of the Lord, the earth shall tremble. And the Bible says that he is with me until the end of the days, until the end of the day. So if he is with me, and the Bible says that the earth will tremble, therefore, wherever I walk has to also tremble because of who I walk with. There is no way you can walk into a room and come back out and the people in there don't got their hair destroyed because of you. There's no reason for them not to be riled up because of you. Because you carry something that they don't. Because who is with you is greater than the one who is in the world. He is greater. Pastor Bo always used to say, when power meets with power, the lesser power, somebody say the lesser power. The lesser power must bow to the greater power. That's why when two undefeated champions, two undefeated champions step into the ring, one of them will walk out defeated and the other one will still be undefeated. Thank God. Thank you, God, because I walk with the pound for pound. The one that wants in every pound, in every division. He has all the belts. He has all the recognition. He has the right training. He knows how to hit hard, and he knows how to hit well, and he'll do that for you. Thank you, Father. I have one more scripture for you. The Bible says in the book of Exodus, chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10, verse 10 to 14. Amen. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What you have done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? 
Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Let me tell you something, church. How many of you have found yourself in a situation, amen, where, where you just gave your life to Christ and you're really excited about Christ and then problems that you never thought you ever would experience start happening and things that start happening in your house that you never thought would ever happen and you tell yourself, it wasn't until I decided to start going to church. Look, I always had my job and the moment I said yes to Jesus, I lost everything. Was that a right decision? And you start questioning your decision. And you start blaming it on everybody. Maybe if I would have not given that tithe, I would have had enough for this. I shouldn't have gone. If I wouldn't have given that love offering, I would have gotten enough for this. And you find yourself always questioning because the devil's hitting you so hard. But let me tell you what happens. This is the way it works. See, the way it works is when you're in the darkness, the enemy is shooting arrows. He's just shooting arrows. And whatever is in the darkness won't get hit because he can't see it. But the Bible says that he is the light. He is the light of this world. And the moment he enters into you, you know what happens? You become a light in the darkness. So now the devil got an aim point. It's not that you make the right decision. It's not that the devil found a threat. So when you turn that light against him, the Bible says that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against me in judgment, I shall condemn. The Bible says, rejoice over me, not my enemy, for if I fall, I shall rise again. I am geared to fight. The Bible says, cover in the army of the Holy Spirit. So, so when you become a target, it's not because you were better off in Egypt, church. You were not better off in Egypt. You were not better off eating onions. You were not better off eating snakes. See, there is a big meal and a big feast for you, church. But, but, but the Egyptians are going to have a problem with that. Not Egypt. I'm talking about in the spirit. Don't go going on Facebook saying, Brother Anthony said kill Egypt. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Look what it says. Look at what Moses answered the people in verse 13. He says, Moses answered the people. Do not be afraid and stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord that he will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never, never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. The problem that you're facing today, once God has dealt with it, you will never again see it again. The problem that you're facing right now, once God has squashed it, that problem cannot come back to life. Because God is the God that makes something dead and nothing can come alive. God is the one that makes something alive and nobody can make dead. God is the one that closes the door and nobody can open. He is the one that opens the door and nobody can make close. So when God makes something and when God does something, it is a finite action. That means that it has no return. When God gives you something, he don't give you no receipt because you can't return it. That is the way God works. Whatever problem you're facing today, church, when this sermon is over, you won't see it again. When this sermon is over, I, I say you won't see it again. Whatever it is that you got going on at the house, you should not be able to see it again. Stop looking for it because it's gone. You speak that over your life. You remember that's how it works. You come into church and you worship and you destroy whatever needs to be destroyed so that you can walk through your wall and receive your miracle. Get up on your feet this morning, church. Hallelujah.